Major funding for this program has been provided by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Douglaston Development, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Joffin Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Markham, LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, Siami Development Inc., SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American. Housing is so important for the nation, and a lot of the housing is financed by the Federal Housing Administration, Fannie Mae, FHA, Freddie Mac, but today I have an individual who has a very unusual background, who runs one of the largest government housing organizations financing. He is the chairman and CEO and chief operating officer of the Greystone Company, which is a holding company providing financing services. I'm happy to have Stephen Rosenberg today with me. Thank you. Now, now Stephen, you know, we were talking and you said your father was an entrepreneur. You know, he grew up in the Bronx and he, you know, he was... Um, he was in the garment business once and something else. And then in, just before you were born, he and your mother and his brother moved out to Miami. And he opened up a motel? Uh, that's right. That's right. He, had, he was a, uh, a serial entrepreneur uh, up in New York and uh, you know, went from one business to another. Um, I think in those days, according to the stories I grew up with, you could start a business with about a nickel or a dime and uh, went from one business to another, made a little bit of money, uh, moved down to Florida, and uh, I was born about a year later, and uh, he did. Had a he, motel. Right? Yes, yes, built a motel uh, in Florida, and uh, that was the business I knew. Now, uh, unfortunately, your, your dad died suddenly when you were 18. Correct. And, and then you said that at that time, I mean, you lived in a, an Orthodox community, but you really became much more Orthodox, and you went to study the Talmud. Correct. And uh, during that period of time, you started in Florida, you then went to Baltimore, and then you came to Memphis, where you felt the Talmud, wouldn't, you know, the studying wouldn't be that tough, and it was tougher because you were an out-of-towner. And then you came back to Brooklyn, uh, to the legendary Chaim Berlin Yeshiva, which is world-renowned. And at that time, you know, it was a tough time. There was no money and everything else. And you then go to college, at two colleges, you went to Toro and to Brooklyn. Uh, correct. Now, correct. What, how, and how do you decide, now, since you, know, you were a Talmud scholar, how do you decide that you wanted to become a dentist, which very few people would know? Um, uh, I, I think for me, at least, it was more the process of elimination. You really how, wanted to be a physician, you said. Um, I, the reality was, um, I really had no 
professional guidance uh, in my life. I had lost my father uh, several years earlier, and my mother hadn't gone to college and was really not in a position to advise me. And uh, at that point in my life, I really didn't have um, much guidance at all. So I really didn't know what I wanted to do uh, with myself. And uh, just as uh, just using the process of elimination, I thought that you know something in the area of medicine uh, would suit me. Um, you know, part of the problem uh, in going to medical school at the time was that in the uh, many ultra orthodox uh, yeshiva, um, it had a problem with during the residency period where you'd have to work on the uh, on the Sabbath, and so medical school was sort of out. And so I uh, chose dental school to so you, try to get so into. So you graduate, even though you went to Toro and to Brooklyn, you graduate Toro, and then you get a scholarship to University of Pennsylvania Dental School. A scholarship and student loans to, to over there. And you were telling me, you know, you, you really never really enjoyed dentistry. Your, your hands, you know, to be a dentist, you have to have hands, uh, which are very you know, working hands, and, and you then decided, since you were at the University of Pennsylvania, you had the opportunity to go to graduate school, and you go for your MBA. Uh, correct. When I was in dental school, it was you know, clear to me, as it was to just about everyone else in the dental school, that uh, the type of artistic ability that you need to be a great dentist uh, was not one of my, um, it was not one of my characteristics. That was not one of my assets. And so I began looking around and luckily for me, the rule at the University of Pennsylvania, and I believe it's still that way, is that if you're in one graduate school and you get accepted to another graduate school, you don't have to pay two tuitions at the same time. And so I, in the middle of dental school, I applied, and I applied to and was accepted to Wharton. And um, once I got in, I just had to do both programs uh, simultaneously. So I was going to the dental school full-time and, and Wharton, Wharton full-time. Full so yeah. now, uh, now you're married, you have two children, at that point, two children. You're married and you have two children. You have student loans, and you don't want to be a dentist. And what happens? So you graduate in 83, I believe, correct? Correct. And yeah. in January of 84, what happens to you? Uh, so in January of 84, I had, when I was finishing up dental school and finishing up Wharton, I sent out uh, a lot of resumes and uh, got an interview at uh, A.G. Becker, and luckily they accepted me and I got a job there, and uh, began, that was my first job in and 1984. Well, now, now, you were in energy and power plants? Um, I thought when I started the position that because I had this healthcare background that they'd probably use me in healthcare finance, but uh, they decided at the time they didn't need anyone in that area, and so they they put me in an area uh, uh, that was financing uh, power plants. And so that's what I did as an associate. Now, A.G. Becker is then acquired by Merrill Lynch, and they say no room for Steve Rosenberg, right? Right. A, a wise decision on their part. And what happens next? Um, again, it, this is, uh, I'd only been at A.G. Becker for, uh, at that point, about eight months. And... Uh, at that point, after Merrill Lynch said they didn't want me, I started interviewing and in, had, had got an interview at uh, Matthews and Wright, which a was small, a small investment municipal, banking. right, municipal shop uh, that did investment banking, mostly in the housing area, and uh, got a job at Matthews and Wright. And then all of a sudden, you know, you're in New York with Matthews and Wright, working on housing, providing housing finance and other things, and you get a phone call from Dean Witter. Um, what actually happened, there was a, a couple of months where I had left Matthews and Wright and thought that I could provide some consulting on housing, municipal bond issues, and uh, did that for several months and uh, found myself uh, nearly starving 
because business was not as easy as I thought it would be. And um, out of the blue, I did get a call from Dean Witter and uh, asking me to come down uh, to interview for the position of you know, National Director of Housing. In Atlanta. In Atlanta, correct. So you pick up the kids, you pick up the wife, and you move down to Atlanta. Right, right. Totally unprepared for this position. But, the, you know, the, the interesting thing is uh, you're in that position for three years, and then Steve Rosenberg, who's been structuring financing for housing and municipal bonds and all the rest, says, I'm 33 years of age, I think, at this time. Um, in 88, 33. 33 years of age. I'm going to start a company called Greystone. Why did you, I'll tell the story about it, but why did you call it Greystone? Um, at the time that I started, uh, there wasn't much to the company or me, for that matter. And I remember doing one transaction as a consultant and a second one. And then uh, one of my uh, dearest friends, uh, an, an attorney, called and said, you know, Steve, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to come up with a name. Don't call yourself call Steve Rosenberg. Uh... Right, right. That would not be a great name to use. And uh, so he suggested that I come up with a name. And so what I decided to do is try to create a name that would at least conjure up a perception of stability, which I didn't have, old money, which I didn't have any of. I didn't have any new money either. And... Um, uh, just in a sense of history and just thinking about what perception I wanted to create um, I just you know the name Greystone came now, to but me. But now the interesting thing which I didn't tell but which I left the best yet to come is Greystone was in the back of a music store in a shopping center in Atlanta and the headquarters was the back of the music store and your desk was a door that you bought at Home Depot on top of a file cabinet. Right. Yeah, I went to Home Depot and got a, uh, an unvarnished door. And uh, the good thing about an unvarnished door is that you could take notes on it. And uh, had two rusty file cabinets. And uh, the door was sitting on top of the file cabinets. And there was a phone sitting on top of the door. And that was the and corporate that was head, it. That was the corporate headquarters. So, the world headquarters. The world. The, 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 right. the world headquarters of Graceland, which today you have 17 offices, 4,000 employees. It's a, it's, it's a much bigger, different company. And during that period of time, you said to me, uh, you couldn't do business with it in Atlanta because basically people would say, what is this, Steve Rosenberg in the, in, in the music store? So you were traveling around the country and really helping companies who had defaulted debt. Right, right, right before I left Dean Witter, I had done one transaction involving a property that was financed with a HUD insured mortgage. And uh, in that case, the HUD insured mortgage was the collateral for a tax exempt bond financing. And the property was in default. And we had figured out an interesting way, creative way to refinance that property and deliver a, a better solution then was out available in the market. And so I thought that this would be a, a good way to start a business, look for properties that had the same characteristics, um, government insured mortgage, tax exempt financing, that were in trouble, and try to develop a business around that. And you do that, and you find this travel agent who's able to get you special tickets, what happened? Well, I, I, I certainly didn't have the money to afford travel on one day's notice. And sometimes that's exactly what you need to do. I'd call a borrower up. I'd explain what I had done in previous transactions. He said, you know, I'd love to meet you. But the problem is traveling the next day is very expensive. But I had a magical travel agent. And uh, this travel agent would allow me to purchase tickets that were uh, I could buy six months ahead of the travel time, and so the tickets were pretty inexpensive. And there was a certain stamp that he could put on the uh, on the ticket, and I'd be able to travel the next day. No questions asked. Uh, yeah, 
That, that's that's how the so industry it's, worked. Now it's 1990, and you said, "I gotta let, let this. Let me move out of this." And you, you opened up an office, and you even hired a secretary. Or about 1990, correct? In, in, in 1990, and then you know you got got involved with FHA financing. Why don't you explain what FHA and Fannie Mae financing does for my audience? Right, sure. Um, both FHA and Fannie Mae financing allow a borrower to secure very advantageous debt financing on their property. Uh, the, the way FHA works is that um, the government, through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, uh, provides insurance on mortgages. And so Greystone, as a lender, would make a loan to a borrower, and that loan would be guaranteed by the, by the by the U.S. government, by the Department of Housing and Urban Development. And so it's an insured product. They provide insurance on loans. And you do it for the multifamily. You, uh, correct. Right. You don't do the, the three, three and a half percent deals that individuals can go through FHA. Um, we do three and a half percent interest rates on multifamily loans. On multifamily. So we don't do lending to single family correct. borrowers. Um, the, the Fannie Mae program is very similar in that um, we, Greystone originates a loan to a borrower. That loan then gets delivered by Greystone to Fannie Mae. And in return, we receive a Fannie Mae mortgage-backed security, and which we sell in the open, in the capital markets. So, okay. so now it's 1994, and you move up to New York, and you really grow Greystone. So what, 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 what happened? What was the, the impetus that changed Greystone, in your opinion, that you've grown from one employee to 4,000 employees from 1994 on? on? I think the, the greatest um, sort of uh, change that occurred was uh, when we decided that we were developing an expertise in these HUD-insured defaulted loans. And we thought that we could, we didn't see anyone else paying attention to this area because dealing with a government insured defaulted loan required a lot of paperwork and, and a certain amount of expertise because uh, if you made some mistakes, HUD didn't have to provide the full insurance. And uh, we decided that we could potentially just try to buy the government insured defaulted loans uh, directly out of the market. So instead of going you know, one by one to borrowers that had properties that were in default, we could try to, on a more wholesale basis, purchase defaulted loans from the lenders that were holding those loans. And uh, as a result, we were able to, uh, because of the nature of the loan, the government guarantee, we were able to get advantageous financing at the time. And uh, uh, over time, you know, we were holding um, Sometimes two hundred million, sometimes almost a billion dollars of these defaulted loans. Now, for my audience purpose, I mean, if you didn't take care of it, the government would have had headaches on this. On this, on we have property. absolutely. We have. Uh, um, I think we've saved HUD um, you know, certainly you know, billions of dollars um, from purchasing these defaulted loans and doing workouts on the loans. Had we not purchased the defaulted loans, the loans would have been assigned to HUD, and HUD would have had to make a claim payment uh, on those loans. So that's one aspect of Greystone. But another, I mean, as you said before, another important aspect of Greystone is that you're one of the largest finances of FHA financing for, for multifamily as well as nursing homes. Correct. And assisted living, I mean, in, in the country. I mean, you've done, you service close to $9 billion of loans? Correct. We've got a $9 billion servicing portfolio. Um, that business began as we started doing workouts on defaulted loans. Uh, we developed a loyalty from the borrowers that, whose loans we were working out. And when it came time for them to do their normal financing, um, they came to us. And we, again, developed an expertise in, uh, in doing those loans. And um, you know, I must say that the, the one thing that has, I think, kept us ahead of the curve is that we 
um, we wake up every morning asking ourselves how we can do what we did yesterday better. Now, you, you were saying to me you are probably the, one of the largest finances of FHA in the country? Uh, I think in 2009 and 10, we were the second largest um, FHA financer in the country for multifamily and nursing homes. Now, in addition, Greystone owns some nursing homes, am I correct? Uh, we own about uh, 3,000 skilled nursing beds and about um, a little over 6,000 apartment units around the country. And the, where are the nursing homes and the beds? The nursing homes are primarily located in Florida, some in Indiana, and the multifamily, are, uh, multifamily properties are located around the country and uh, with a concentration also in Indiana. Now, you, as you also said to me, you were also involved with student loans. Uh, correct. We had taken over a subsidiary of GMAC that was in the student loan business, and uh, we purchased government-guaranteed student loans and securitized uh, those loans and did about, uh, we did several billion. And um, currently, we've sort of moved the student loan business into the area that we're very comfortable with, which is dealing with defaulted or previously defaulted government-guaranteed student loans. Sort in of a first cousin. Now, to. In the first cousin, then you started Greystone Bank. Correct. And what is Greystone Bank? Um, again, we started Greystone Bank because we, uh, we knew we had the ability at Greystone to originate loans multifamily and nursing home loans through our origination network and we were doing that in the multifamily again in the nursing home area. Um, what we didn't have is a stable source of financing. We had bank lines and we had different credit facilities and I thought at the time that having a bank could, we knew we could create good loan assets and having a bank would facilitate that because it allowed you to um, take money in with a U.S. government guarantee on those funds. So you get the bank, then you had the factor. Correct. Somewhere along the way, uh, we also had the opportunity to purchase a uh, fa factoring company based in Dallas, and um, and you know that company is still there, um, again financing receivables. So, I mean, so Greystone, I mean, is, is truly in, in many areas. But let's talk about you and your, and your family. Grace, you have today, what, five sons? Uh, five sons. And, a and daughter. one daughter. Yes. And how many of them are in the business? Uh, right now, uh, I've got uh, uh, three sons that are in the business full time and one son who's in college, who's taken a semester off, who's there part time. And you know, you, you you've decided. I mean, you know, I, I did this extra research. You've been very involved in giving back. Uh, I think in 2009, you were the Northeast um, honoree for APAC. Uh, correct. And uh, you've been involved with the Center for Jewish Heritage. Correct. And uh, you've also been involved, and in, you personally and Greystone, because you are Greystone, in giving back to the National Housing the scholarship or. Uh, that's correct. That's now, what, correct. What did you do? What's that involvement with the National Housing? Uh, again, it, it's, a, it's an organization that supports uh, housing in the country, and uh, we are a part of the organization and felt that it was appropriate to give back to the organization that so, supports. So, so what do you see, I mean, because you're still a young guy and you got and uh, you have some really good sons. I've met only two of them, but I, I know they're wonderful guys. What do you see in the in the next couple of years for Greystone? You know, with this turbulent, good, you know, the market's getting better, the economy. Where do you see Greystone growing? Um, at this point, I would say that the um, the government agency financing business uh, it has grown by leaps and bounds in the last few years as a result of banks not doing as much lending as they were before, the Wall Street conduits essentially disappearing and just beginning to come back now. And so um, 
one thing that's one very strong aspect about the government programs, especially HUD, is that uh, they are, while they're a conservative lender, of the lenders out there now, they're probably the most aggressive. Uh, most other lenders are lending 70%, 75% loan to value. Um, HUD, FHA will still insure loans up to you know, 83%. And uh, so we're seeing that business uh, grow uh, strongly. And we also see the ability for the Fannie Mae business to grow significantly. So we're seeing growth in those two now, areas. Now, the, you know, there has been a discussion, I mean, that people, you know, at one time, people wanted to own their own home. But today, more people are renting than owning. So that would have a much bigger effect on the growth of Greystone and the FHA and Fannie Mae, correct? I, I think that the, uh, that would certainly help the rental industry if fewer people are actually are, are buying homes. Uh, by the same token, we're seeing a lot of areas where the single family homes that have been foreclosed on are being turned into rentals, which hurts the, uh, the rental industry. Um, the one, the significant aspect in the market now that is particularly helping Greystone is that there are so many borrowers that have loans that are due in the next year or few years from that these, are over leveraged. Right, from the securitization. Exactly. Of the so how will, how will you be able to handle that? Um, the way we best handle that is that the government agency programs that we work with, mostly the HUD program which and the Fannie Mae program, which lend significantly more than, uh, than conduits are willing to lend now, and that really almost any other lender, I think if we combine those programs with additional funds that we are accumulating now to provide gap financing for borrowers that have slightly over leveraged properties, combining the FHA or Fannie Mae programs with additional funding that Greystone either use, utilizing its own capital or capital that we're raising as a fund um, should be able to be very effective in capturing market share to be able to refinance those properties. So I, I have to say, you know, I always like unusual backgrounds. I have not had uh, on all my shows someone who was a dentist, who had his MBA. I've had some people who've had different degrees uh, and who's truly uh, been very valuable in providing housing and, you know, healthcare facilities around the nation. And I'd like to thank you for being here today. Thank you very much for having me. Major funding for this program has been provided by grants from Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, and Perfect Building Maintenance, New York Community Bank, All Nation Renovation, Kilroy Architectural Windows, New York's Window Company, Greenberg Traurig, LLP. Additional funding has been provided by grants from AVR Realty Company, LLC, Briarwood Organization, Capital One Bank, C.B. Richard Ellis, Cushman and Wakefield, Dime Savings Bank of Williamsburg, Eastern Consolidated, Douglaston Development, Hal Fetner, Durst Fetner Residential, Stephen Napolitano, First American Title Insurance Company, Friedman, LLP, Gemini Real Estate Advisors, LLC, Genova, Burns and Gian Tomasi, Grubb and Ellis, Investors Savings Bank, Jack Joffa and Associates Real Estate Consultants, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Institute at Syracuse University, Madison Realty Capital, Markham, LLP, Marcus and Millichap Real Estate Investment Services, Margolin Weiner and Evans, LLP, Massey Knackle Realty Services, M&T Bank, Meridian Capital Group, The Moynian Group, Newmark Knight Frank, Orphanides and Associates, Siami Development Inc., SJP Properties, Sterling and Sterling Inc., RAL Companies and Affiliates, LLC, Spandrel Property Services, Urban American.